Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Oh, it is so good to be here on another Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. for you guys in the States. I guess it's late afternoon uh, for <laughs> you all. You hear the phone, right? Um, yeah. So um, we are excited to be here once again. My name is Mac, if you don't know that. And this is my beautiful wife, Myra. And we come out every uh, Sunday at the five o'clock hour on the East Coast. And we share from the gospel of truth. And today uh, we have another uh, interesting topic which is under the heading of uncovering the delusion, choosing culture over Christ. And I know that Myra is getting ready to mm -hmm. go into detail about uh, what that all means, and then I'm going to follow behind her as well. But I, I do have a particular motivation that happened to us while we were actually traveling not that long ago, um, and I'm trying to be careful because I don't want to mention names of people, but it was the, out of an experience that she and I dealt with that is the first time that that was really planted in us. And um, I've been just kind of waiting to see how that could be a subject. But with the current things that are going on in our world, um, it really speaks to that that whole thing. So even before Myra gets started, have you ever just thought about how much of the way that we act, how much of the things that we do, how much of our conversation is based on culture, and how much of it is based on Christ? That's not a question that y'all have to answer, although if you want to answer it in the chat, uh, we'll be uh, looking at all comments as well. So I am going to actually uh, turn this over to Myra, and she is going to pray us in if she's so led, and then lead us in this uh, subject. So Myra, it is all you. Still trying to turn the phone off, but <laughs> we will go ahead. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for another day and another opportunity to show forth your love through the word of God and how you are speaking to us and how you desire the best for us and from us. So, Lord, we place this day and this time in your hands knowing that you are good and your goodness is ever-present in our lives, Father. So. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Uncovering the delusion, choosing culture over Christ. And when he told me that, I went, oh, well, what really does culture mean? Because I had to look that up because I wanted to make sure we were on the right page. It said the Miriam... Uh, what's the last name, the, dic the dictionary? Oh, Miriam Webster. Webster, right. Says, all the ways of life, including arts, beliefs, and institutions of a population that are passed down from generation to generation. The way of life for an entire society. It includes, number one, codes of manners. And you'd be thinking about, when I thought, thought about that, it was like, okay, I remember, let's go back to the 60s when I was young. People were more polite. You asked permission. Everyone said, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. That's changed. There's a code of manner. That was passed down from the generation before, from my parents' generation and probably from their parents. But things have now changed. It's not like that anymore. People are not as polite. People are not always um, 
conducive to say when you say hello to somebody they might look at you like why are you speaking to me <laughs> i remember coming home one time from guatemala and i got in line and i just spoke to the person in front of me and two people turned around one was an older gentleman and he just smiled and said good morning one was a younger person they looked at me like what's your problem that was a real difference in culture because in guatemala at that time it was it was still very polite and even here it's changing the another two thing is the dress now going back to the 60s i think that's that was some of the beginning of the changes because i remember as a little child we would wear gloves uh, even as a young woman we wore gloves and uh, we wore uh, dresses to our knees, sometimes mid, mid, mid leg. But I remember I was in the 60s. I started wearing a mini skirt. And believe it or not, I went without a bra. But not for long. Because the first time this man looked at me, and I'm talking to him, and he's looking at my chest, that Judeo Christian upbringing rose up in my spirit and I went home and put on a bra. That was from another generation. But now, it's just part of the culture now. Everything is very revealing. And back then in the 60s, it was changing. Things were changing. And the language, that's another situation. When, when I was living in Guatemala all year round and only come home one month out of the year, I would notice that the language on the television was different. We never heard a cuss word, never, never, when I was growing up. Then one year I came home and I heard the D word. I was like, oh, I was kind of shocked. And then I heard another word that's stronger the next time I came home. And then I heard the F word, which is in everything now. So that was, that, that was the culture. That's become the bad words accepted. In public, it's no big deal. Nobody flinches. Religion. I remember, I remember when I was little in elementary school, and some boys were bothering me. Kids were throwing my hat back and forth or something stupid. And I said, I pulled myself up and said a bad word. I heard this voice coming from above, not God, but it was my sixth grade teacher. And she said, Myra Green, what church do you go to? And I went like, oh, because the religion, the relationship with Christ was part of your upbringing and should be expressed in the way you carried yourself. I wasn't like, what's she talking about? No, I was like, I, it embarrassed me because I was trying to, you know, be like these bad kids. But now, if someone, the, the mention of religion comes like, don't talk about it, or, oh, you one of those religious ones. It's not respected, and especially Christianity. Because I can't say anything about Muslims because they'll kill you if, if you disrespect them. But let's, let's talk about Christianity. It's not respected. And then the other one, the next one that's part of the culture it says rituals. Now I have to think about that because I looked the word up because there's a series of actions or type of behavior regularly and invariably followed by someone. I thought, what would that be now? You know what came to my mind from the news? Gangs. Mm. How gangs dictate young people because they don't have the home. They don't, may have not a father or a mother or the home is trouble. That becomes their family. It's not a natural family, it's unnatural. So the gangs dictate. Another thing I thought about was the thing that was going around all over the country, snatch and grab. So let's go snatch and grab. That's following action or type of behavior regularly. It's like, I don't have to think about it. I'm with this gang, I'm with these group of people, and this is what we do. Harassing the elderly. That's, that's cultural now. You, you hear of it walking down the street, and some kid will come up and splash something on you or knock you down. It's harassing the elderly, beat you up. 
And then I thought about cheating on taxes, but that could have happened a long time ago too. But now if somebody said, yeah, I got to do my taxes and I'm cheating on it. And they were like, oh yeah, that's normal. So that those kind of moral standards that a lot of people follow. The sixth thing was art. And the first thing came to my mind was the revealing of an antichrist attitude along with you know the revealing of, of your body now i was an art major and i did a painting of a new it was classical you know it was art now i remember some years ago in the in these last 60 60 years i would say there was a painting in canada and it was a painting of Christ on the cross in a bottle of urine. And that was considered art. That is culturally weird. And then the seventh thing was about your beliefs. And okay, when I was growing up uh, in school, there was a couple girls that got pregnant and, and I know one in particular had two babies and still finished school. She just carried them high on the side. But it wasn't normal. It wasn't normal. It, it was something that was like, oh, you're not going to parade that around. Now, everybody gets a baby shower. You celebrate. And there's nothing wrong with the baby because you don't want to ostracize the baby or ostracize the mother. But we're celebrating having babies out of wedlock? It's crazy. But one of the things that is being expressed a lot was, is a woman's body is her decision. You can't say there was never any abortion, because abortion has always been with us. But it wasn't something that someone would share and stand up for, and stand up for, for others. But that's part of the culture now. Promiscuity. Um, if you were married and you had an affair years ago, it was frowned on. It is happening. It was happening, but now it's like I'm having an affair. Or if you were single and you you had a boyfriend forever, wasn't going anywhere, but you knew that they were being intimate. I was there before I got saved. I was part of the. I was involved with the culture, and now this this my truth. This is what I believe. Hmm. That's part of the culture. So that took me to, in the Legacy Standard Bible version, Paul writes in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, about the limits of Old Testament beliefs and how lifting the veil revealed the true glory of Christ. There was glory in the Old Testament but there was a greater glory in Christ. So 2 Corinthians 3, starting at 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter. He's talking to Christians. Now remember where these Corinthians came from. They came from a very lecherous lifestyle. And they're standing now for Christ. But there's some, still some teaching necessary for them to understand. And this is speaking to Christians, people who say, I am a Christian. You are our letter, having been written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, ministered to by us, which is Paul and his compatriots, having been written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of hearts of flesh. Because this is the work of Christ in our hearts. And such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. That's another attitude. But our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And that's, that's the power we have as Christians. We're not living by the letter. We were talking about that a little bit. I wasn't so much. Dan, uh, Mac was talking a little bit 
to Dan about knowing the word, reading the word, but not really knowing the author of the word. So you had the letter of the word. We, we, we don't do this, we don't do that. But mm. if you know, if you really know the word, the Ten Commandments came to show us that we were sinners, that we can't do that. But in Christ, we can do all things. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death and letters having been engraved on stones came with glory, that's the Old Testament, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, which was being brought to an end, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be even more in glory? The Spirit that's living within us as we call ourselves Christians. The power. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, you hear that? Mm. Condemnation in Old Testament. We're talking about, we're not talking about the people out there that's promiscuous and doing all this evil. There was an element in the church that only said, you're going to go to hell. You're fire and brimstone. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. It was condemnation over and over and over again. But the ministry of condemnation has glory, and it did. Much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Because the law brought people to a place where they knew they could not actually do it. So someone's walking around with a Bible and says, I'm all this. They lie because they're not. But if they can express, like, I know that I have, my sufficiency is in Christ. Because I can't do this by myself. And that's something we all have to learn and understand. We can't live this life without the Spirit and the gift that it brings to us, the power to overcome and to live a life that's pleasing to the to the world to the world to the lord <laughs> <laughs> to the lord god almighty for the if the spirit of condemnation has glory much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory for indeed what had been glorious in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it for it which for if that which was being brought to an end was with glory, much more that which, which, which remains is in glory. That's our spirit. The Holy Spirit is living within us that we depend upon because we can't depend upon a man. And the people in the Old Testament were basically depending upon the word that God gave Moses. But they were looking more at Moses. They, they called it Moses' law. It had, it brought no, th that's why the Jewish people are still looking for Messiah. They're living in rituals. So these rituals are not just the worldly rituals. There's always, there's also religious rituals that have no glory in it, that have no power, that have no joy and no peace. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness and not, are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel will not look intently at the consequence of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened for until this very day at the teaching, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is brought to an end in Christ. You can read and read and read and understand what Moses is saying, but it does nothing to your heart until you understand the sacrifice and the gift that was manifested in the Holy Spirit through Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. We are no longer blind. I was, I was telling Mac, I was watching this um, thing on television, and I wish I could remember, but it was, a, it was a couple that he was gay, 
and she was a lesbian who wanted to be, she wanted to be a man. And they met, and they, they, they felt they were Christians. And the commentator asked him, you felt you were, you were Christians? He said, yeah. He said, because I was blind. I had a veil over my eyes. And until the veil was taken away. And what happened to them is that he no longer desired a man, he desired a woman. And this woman wanted to be a man. And God changed her to the point where she wanted a man. And she had actually had her breasts removed. And she had been taking medication to transform her organs and her hormones. But you know what? This woman and this man talked about how God just showed himself to them and brought so much joy and contentment within their lives. And you know what? She had a baby. And now she's pregnant again. And they said, all the, all the doctors said she could never have that. But because... The veil was taken off of their eyes. Things they had believed. He believed he was, he, he, he had been molested when he was a child. She had been molested as a child. And her mother said she was weird. The parents, of his parents said, you, you're, you're, you're gay, you're, you're autistic, you, you have all the, so he was raised up believing that that's who he was. But see what, when you take that veil off, what happens? All these things in the culture that so many of us, including Christians, follow. It's okay if they have an abortion. That's, on, that's their decision. Instead of saying, oh, that's so sad that they don't know the Lord in a way to understand that that's murder. I'm going to pray for that person that they will have that veil taken from their eyes. And I'm so glad that I, I don't have to say that this, this body is mine. I don't have to make that choice because my, my body belongs to Christ. And whatever he wants me to do with it, that's what I will do. No matter what happens to me. My decisions come from what he says, not from what I may want or I think is best for me. He is the answer to everything. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's freedom. When we get caught up in our own selves, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to look what they're doing. I want to follow that. That's not freedom. You're attaching yourself to things that are ungodly. And we should know that. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord. Behold the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And that's what happened to that, co that couple. They were transformed into the same image. From no matter what they had done to their bodies, no matter what their mind had gone through, when that veil was taken off their eyes, they became what they were called to be, people who had the image of God. Because when you look at Moses, who's a man, and you look at Christ, there's no, there's no comparison. Moses was a good man, but Moses did not have the finished answer to everything. Christ has that. Then we go into Hebrews 5 and 6. He, Jesus, in the days of his flesh, offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. See, we don't want to suffer. But Jesus was willing to suffer because we're going to suffer. As Christians, we're going to suffer. Because in this environment, this cultural environment, we're not welcome. We're foolish. We're considered foolish. We, we, we're considered a, a one-laner. We, we're only going in one direction. But that's true. Our focus is Christ. 
But no, the world says, no, you got to be very, you know, you have to think about this and you can change about that and you have to be open. No, we are in a one lane. And that's not conforming to the culture. We're supposed to be all over the place. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm happy today. Tomorrow, I may go and say, well, I want to be anesthetized. I don't want to live anymore. And people do that. But that's not Christ. Concerning the him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain. Since you have become dull of hearing, he's talking to us. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. The church, the people of God are starting to look more and more like the culture where we should be out there teaching the word of God, not necessarily with a Bible, a, 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 a list of, uh, think in Spanish, a list of uh, verses and, and homonyms and homilies, but with counsel, with listening to the people, having a hearing heart and being able to, to be, you know, to understand and to be able to speak the words, whatever God gives you, even if it's not any words at all, if it's just to sit there and be with that person, but teaching them like, how do you stay so calm? And, and why are you always so joyful? We should be those teachers, but, someone to teach you the elementary principles of oracles of God. That's us. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. Now we should know what's good and evil. <laughs> we act like we don't. That's not fair. Oh, that's just them. That's not. No, sin is sin. Evil is evil. And there's a warning in, in the sixth uh, chapter of Hebrews about falling away. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. When we're not working in the things of the Lord, the works that we do are dead. If we're not truly hearing from God and following his direction, the works we do are dead. And of faith towards God, of teaching about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are things most Christians talk about. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those once having been enlightened and having tasted of the heavenly spirit and having become partakers of the Holy Spirit and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and having fallen away, it is impossible. This is the word of God. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. If you're out there stating, I am a Christian, and I'm doing this work for him, and I know these words, I, I, we're going to baptize, we're going to do this, and it's basically talking to the leaders of the churches, pastors, bishops, deacons, people who are out there saying all the right things, but really are not living it. You're falling away because behind closed doors, you're not the same person. And you said, I have accepted Christ. I know the Holy Spirit is living within me. And you've tasted the good word. You came out strong and, and you got caught up in the things of the world. Money, adoration, you're, such, you're so this and you're so that got to be careful about my pastor this and my pastor that. Come hear the word of my pastor. No. Come hear the word of the Lord. Because that affects him. Pray for your leaders that they, they stay humble 
that they don't fall into that trap of being all that and really not having the fortitude by the word of God to understand that what they're going through is falling away because they're looking at, look at me. Look how they look at me. And then someone comes along and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So your, the heart is being changed. Become partakers of the Holy Spirit? How can you walk away from that? Taste of the good word of God and the power of the age to come? For, for ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. We have the former rain and the latter rain. It, it just, God has poured on us. Are we rich? Are we famous? Do we have a lot of things? Not necessarily. But we have the joy of the Lord. We have the satisfaction of knowing who we belong to and where we're going for eternity. And the desire to be an instrument of God to encourage and influence someone else to look in that direction, to look for what they're missing in their life. But if this ground yields thorns and thistles, it is unfit and cl close to being cursed and its end is to be burned. That's the word of the God. A harshness of God, of a harshness of heart to God's teaching without repentance leads to a slow death of faith. It's almost like saying God doesn't see because I look good over here, but God doesn't see what I'm doing. Actions that are repeatedly inconsistent with faith reveal the death of faith or belief in us. It's apostasy, big word. It means an act of refusing to follow, obey him. Refusing. It's not like I'm doing something and we all do at one point or another and we all need to repent of those things and not go in that direction. But this says refuse. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this in front of people behind their back. I'm going to do whatever I want. But we have the inheritance of the promises. We are, but we are convinced about you. And see, that's the word of God. He'll say all this stuff that's just true that will hurt your heart because you know he's talking to you and it should hurt your heart. It should hurt our heart, it should convict us. But then he comes back and just loves on us. He says, but we are commend, convinced about you beloved of things that are better and that belong to salvation. Though we are speaking in this way. See, even though I'm telling you these truths that will happen if you don't be repentant of the actions that you're doing that are ungodly. But God is not unrighteous so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name and having ministered and continue to minister to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not become dull but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The dullness is shown in the way we look like the world. Because we gotta be sharp. Like, oh, it doesn't matter if I, if I do this. No, no, mm, mm God has given us Christ and the Holy Spirit. We must listen to what he says and not move backwards. The consequences are dire. But when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. But it's, it's worthless. In the same way, God, desiring any, even more to show to the heirs of the promise 
the unchangeableness of his purpose, guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, what's those two unchangeable things? The promise and the oath. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and confirmed and one which enters within the veil. So now we can go to the holiest of holy at where a forerunner has ended for us. Jesus have become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. There's that veil again. Because that veil is taken away, we can see the truth. And it ends up with some things in Hebrews 13 that have not changed. It says marriage is honorable in all. And the, law, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Verse 6, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what men shall do unto me. That's the standard of a Christian. We're not going to be fearful. We can't. Because he, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because God is with us. We have to. Eight, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. His dictates have not changed. People say the Bible's old for the old times. No. It says in the word, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 14, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That's what the culture needs to understand. They're living for today, but they're not living for tomorrow. And we should not be a part of that. We should be an influencer to help them to understand that. Let us offer, this is 15, the sacrifice of praise to God continually that the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. 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 Thank you, beloved. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> so, um, before I... Uh, start on my <clears throat> interpretation of our subject today, which, uh, as a reminder, is uncovering the delusion, choosing culture over Christ. <clears throat> Want to just give shout outs to Gloria Thompson and to Angel Daniel Bosel, mm. who <clears throat> have been with us throughout the entire uh, last 40 minutes or so. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, also want to let you guys know that after today, mm. we're gonna be taking a little bit of a break, um, mainly because I'm traveling. And uh, so after today, we won't be back uh, in this capacity until August 18th. And yes, we see you on hell. God bless you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, we won't be putting out any content unless I might be able to sneak in something um, somewhere in my travels. Uh, just to give you a, a hint, uh, the places I'm going to, uh, they're in different time zones. I don't know how it's going to line up with the schedule that I have to keep while I'm in those areas and um, don't want to make it hard for our host if it ends up being like a weird time during the day and all of a sudden I'm trying to do a uh, Facebook Live. So we're just going to kind of shut it down and uh, both Myra and I could use a little bit of a breather, but when we get back August 18th, we're coming back better than ever. <laughs> With that said, I, I want to let you guys know that I started thinking about this as an actual subject. It's been several months ago because 
of a visitation that we had with um, some friends of ours. And it just happened to come up in the conversation for uh, confidentiality purposes. It's not important to know what the circumstances are that brought this up, but it ended up being this question that was asked, what are you gonna do? Are you going to conform to the culture or are you gonna conform or transform, that's the better way of putting it, transform to Christ? And it, it got me thinking about it because, um, you know, Myra and I, as we are sitting right now, we are in Guatemala. And Myra just had this conversation with me the other day. And I said, isn't that apropos that we would be talking about the culture here? Um, in our private conversation, and I'll share enough of that just to give you guys a, a taste of what that's all about. So Myra has been a part of this uh, Guatemalan community for the past 29 years. So she's very comfortable in it. She's, you know, my goodness. If you ask her <laughs> where she comes from, she won't tell you Baltimore. Nah, she's going to tell you, oh, I'm from Guatemala. And, and that's just a, a laugh that we have with ourselves because the moment that she says that, I'm rolling my eyes like, come on, woman. Okay, but but I will say that because of the length of time that she's been in this culture, and this place actually has a culture, mm -hmm. um, she has taken on quite a bit of that culture in her own interacting with, uh, you know, our friends and with the people in general in this area. And then uh, seven years ago, she marries this guy, me, and I'm used to the Western culture, which would be North America, uh, but I'm also very comfortable in the African culture. And believe me, they're all different, all right? And so now here I come into this area and let's just say that they don't do everything the way I would understand things should be done. Now the question becomes, is that right or wrong either way? And my beautiful wife is always reminding me, honey, you have to adapt to the culture. This is just the way it is. And every time that we have someone come into our presence who has been to the United States, I'm always inquiring, do you understand what's going on here? And I, again, I'm not going to bring the different characteristics because I'm not really trying to offend, but they're different. And I'm, I guarantee you, uh, people, they might not tell me, but they would say in their own private space, that guy is too abrupt. He is too honest. He is too straightforward because that is the nature of who I am. You know, is that right or wrong? Well, it's the culture. And so I'm just having a little bit of fun with that <laughs> because we are dealing with different dynamics as it pertains to culture. You know, I'm talking about geographical cultures, but we also have a political culture we have, uh, well, I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, a church culture, mm -hmm. all right? We have a world culture, mm -hmm. just the nature of the world. And all of these different types of cultures are always in conflict with each other. 
And what it does is that each culture has to take the time to listen before just abruptly responding to everything. And so I think even Myra would say, for me personally, I'm getting better with that. Yes, you are. You know, so I'm learning now. I'll ask my questions in private to her, <laughs> but I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to accept things as they are. Um, but now how does that work? when we're talking about a differential between the world culture mm. and Christ. And that's where we are today. So in typical fashion for me, I have to have an understanding of what certain words mean so that I can see how to actually share these messages. So. If you look at our title, it is Uncovering the Delusion, Choosing Culture Over Christ. Because right now, my argument is that culture is winning over Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why I put it that way. And so, easy definition to uncover something it means to expose it. It means to bring that which may be hidden and bring it to light. Mm -hmm. So that's the uncovering. The delusion, and I tried to find a biblical definition for delusion. So this is what I came up with. It is to reject the truth, but find pleasure in unrighteousness mm. okay so when i say the truth i'm not doing the world's kind of definition of mm -hmm. of truth because you hear it all the time well you got your truth and yeah. i and i got my truth mm -hmm. well so i don't believe in any of that okay truth is christ and so anything that's not christ is not truth and it becomes culture mm -hmm. all right so I found a couple of scriptures to kind of help you all understand where I'm coming from. So the first one is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, and so all of them who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in evil, mm -hmm. will be condemned. Mm -hmm. There are consequences mm -hmm. to not being about the truth. And so we have to be careful when we're talking about the nature and culture of the world and the uh, transformative experience of Christ to understand that if you're in a situation where you feel like you need to adapt your belief in Christ in order to fit a world culture, mm. then I think that you are not understanding Christ at all because I don't see Christ changing himself at any time to fit the mm. culture of his time when, mm -hmm. when as Jesus, he walked the earth. He was always about his father's business. He was always about saying, I and the father are one. And the way that he would say that about the father is the way that we as followers of the way, as believers should say that about Christ. Amen. When you've seen me, you've seen Christ, okay? When you hear the things that I'm saying, you have heard Christ. We're not saying that we are Christ. We are uh, embodying everything that Christ gave as the example of how to live holy and righteous in this earth. And so we want to be a walking, talking, thinking representation of who he is. And so in Romans 1, 
verse 28, it says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a depraved mind mm -hmm. to do what should not be mm -hmm. done. In other words, God loves you so much that he will allow you to do mm -hmm. self-harm, to, to be culturally in tune with the world, but not be transformative mm -hmm. in your relationship with Christ. And so we look at it today. I mean, no one can escape it when we're talking about what the church is looking like today. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that in quotation marks because what most people are calling the church, I don't really call the church because that's just a bunch of folk getting together, shout, jump up, and, and act crazy. Okay. But notice, we, we've had several key members of what I'll call the institutionalized church that have made a, 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 a pathway for all types of activities and actions that are anti-Christ. And that's the only way that I can put it. So, you know, whether you're talking about someone that is gyrating and literally grinding on someone mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be a worship music ministry, <laughs> or whether you have someone that puts on a quote, Easter, another word that I don't like, a Easter presentation, mm -hmm. and you have women prostituting themselves as hotties, and y'all know what I'm talking about. So that's conforming to a culture. Oh, we're going to make it hip hoppy, all right? We're going to make it so that these folks have access and that they can hear. So I'm a staunch disagreer <laughs> of that approach to how we do things simply because I did not see Christ do it and I didn't see my Bible heroes do that either. I, what I did see them doing is understanding the culture around them in order to be able to share the gospel in a way that even the world could hear them but I don't have to wear skinny jeans, which I would look awful in, by the <laughs> way, okay? And I do not have to feminize myself in order to gain an audience. We're small today. I mean, there's not many people that are listening today, but we're not going to do anything in order to build an audience and deny Christ in the process because the culture means nothing to us. Christ means everything, everything mm -hmm. to us. And that's the mm -hmm. point. If we don't get anywhere else today, that's the point that we must understand in order to start changing things so that Christ supersedes culture. And I'm going to make this last personal comment before I continue on, I will tell you guys right here, right now, I love being black. <laughs> I love a lot of the history of my people. I hurt for the things that have hurt us as a people. And I celebrate the uniqueness of what makes us who we are, whether it's my big old wide nose or my, you know, kinky hair, whatever my complexion, even to the way that I talk. I 
embrace that as something that is beautiful and uniquely black. Okay, but here is where we run into trouble. I'm not going to then identify myself as the black church <laughs> because I don't see that in scripture. I don't see a black church. I don't see a white church. I don't see a Asian church. I don't see a, a, a Guatemalan church. I don't see an Australian church. I see the church with each of us being lively stones as being living organisms and together we make up the body of believers. I mean, I just literally had this conversation with our son on hell less than an hour and a half ago. And I was just saying to him, why do you think it is that in the book of Acts, did they say, oh, well, you go ahead and have church. And that means that you're going to sit there and wait for people to come to your door. Hmm. Did they not say that we were going to have to go out into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth? Don't we say, go ye therefore, teach all nations? And believe it or not, that word nations is defined as cultural groups. Hmm. Okay? You got to understand, if you're going to read these scriptures, you got to know what's going on. So we're dealing with cultures. When God told Abram that I am going to make you the patriarch of all nations, he was talking about cultural groups, not just locations, but culture. So we don't want to get it twisted in thinking that for some reason we've got to present ourselves in a certain way so that the multitude will accept us. No, we go out representing the one who made us, the one who died for us, the one who rose again for us, the one who ascended and said, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to provide you with a comforter. That's the one that we are supposed to emulate. And we do this without compromise. And those who God is preparing will know the truth and the truth will make them free. That is how these things work. I'm not gonna jerry curl my hair. I'm not going <laughs> to feminize my attire. I am not going to compromise the word of God if somebody asks me what is your opinion on abortion? What is your opinion on LGBTQ? What is your opinion on women preaching? Or better yet, pastoring? Mm -hmm. I'm going to present God's truth, not Mac's truth, God's truth. And let the chips fall where they may. So if you have seen leadership when asked these questions, him and Hall, and like one person who is really popular in these times, actually go and say, well, you know, different churches do different things. <laughs> okay, that's a cop-out answer. We're not talking about what locations are doing. We're talking about what would God do? What has God commanded? And isn't it something that out of all of the sins that we can think of, isn't it funny how sexual immorality is the one that God uses the most as something that he distastes and despises? When God calls a whole nation a whore, mm. you've got to understand that whorish behavior is a worldly cultural concept. Many times I find myself going to other countries begging them, please don't be like the United States and take away everything that's wrong with it as far as the culture is concerned. 
You want to take away the godliness of its constitution, Bill of Rights, and Declaration of Independence? Go for it. If that's the, the way you experience the United States. But don't take away our tats and take away our piercings and all these things that we have done to sexualize ourselves or to mutilate ourselves for the culture. Both Myra and I are painters. You're literally behind us seeing some of our work, one of my board, but, but most of what you're seeing behind us is either something I've done or something that has been done by either Myra and what's in front of me has actually been done by our grandson. Okay, you can't see it, but it's in there. And that is where art is displayed on a wall as a, a, a statue. It's a beautiful way to express. And, and I mean, I came out the womb drawing and, and painting. All right, so I love to express in that manner but I don't have to tat up my body just because I want to look like the culture. Or what I used to tell my kids, I used to tell them, I said, hey, stop following the trends. Be the trend. Be the example. The, if the example is Christ, then in human form, to the best of one's ability, be that example. Be the walking, talking epistle that he wants us to be. And then you will see that the culture will not have any control over you. You won't just listen to any old thing and because it's part of the culture, be okay with it. You know, I always had to go back to this old commercial, going back to the... 1970s. It was the Hebrews National Commercial that just simply said, I answer to a higher authority. So my authority is not of this world. Does he require that we be obedient to the leadership of this world? Yes, he does. Until it supersedes his. All right, so my allegiance is to God. That's not something culture taught me. That's something God taught me. My allegiance, I pledge allegiance to Yahweh, for he is everything in my life. And to this transformative body that you have given me, I now am part of your nation under your authority with liberty and with your justice forever. And literally that just came off the top of my head. But that's the way that I have chosen to live my life. That would not be the way the culture would teach you or our children to live. So before I just get really long-winded, because I'm always going off script, um, let's talk about these things. And I actually sectioned it off really nicely. There's a lot of scripture that we're going to talk about. So the first thing is just like our subject. We see you, Gloria. God bless you. Exposing the delusion. Now, we got to understand that again, delusion as defined biblically is to reject the truth, to find pleasure in those things that are unrighteous. Mm -hmm. Culture is defined biblically as the sum total of ways of living built up by a group of human beings. Notice not the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. all right? Human beings and transmit it from one generation to another. So in theory, we could have a, the culture of Christ, 
Problem is, not too many people are feeling that culture, mm. okay? And they have succumbed mm. to the nature of our world. And our world does everything that does not promote Christ. Mm. So, man, I got up this morning, crack of dawn. I said, my goodness, I got to put some scripture to all this stuff, Lord. I know what you want me to say. So I went to Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 15. Let me read this for you. All of this is coming out of the New English translation. And it's starting to become a favorite of mine, by the way. Um, but this is how it goes. Listen to the Lord's message. And in fact, in some translations, it says Yahweh's message. Okay, but listen to the Lord's message. You leaders of Sodom, pay attention to our God's rebuke, people of Gomorrah. Of what importance to me are your many sacrifices? This is God talking, okay? I have had my fill of burnt sacrifices of rams and the fat from steers, the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats, I do not want. When you enter my presence, do you actually think I want this? <laughs> Animals trampling on my courtyards? Do not bring any more meaningless offerings. I consider your incense detestable. Mm. You observe new moon festivals, <laughs> Sabbaths, and convocations. But I cannot tolerate sin-stained celebrations. I hate your new moon festivals and assemblies. They are a burden that I am tired of carrying. This is God speaking. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I look the other way. Mm. When you offer your many prayers, I do not listen because your hands are covered with blood. Mm. Now, to put all this in the context, this is Old Covenant. Okay, this is before the appearance of Jesus in flesh. Okay, this is before uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are dealing with a specific peacher, people, excuse me, a culture, dare I say, mm. Israel. And the very thing that God put uh, before Israel as a way of showing their allegiance. Here in Isaiah 1, verses 10 through 15, God despises it. And you have to understand, in order to really understand God, why he would despise these things. I mean, first of all, he equates the leaders and the people to Sodom and Gomorrah. And just like I expressed earlier, those are representations of whoredom and sexual impropriety. And that is the way that God is referring to the leadership. I would dare say in this new covenant experience, God is looking at the leadership, many of them, not all, but many of them in the same fashion. What have you done to my church? And that church are the people. What have you done? You're parading a woman who is in tight clothing and you are calling her your wife and she is standing before people and making proclamations as if she's a prophetess or a preacher of the gospel 
and I do not condone what she is doing. And you say <coughs> that these things are of me. You, you understand what I'm talking about, guys? If you're going to assemble in a building, there's a certain way that you have to do that. And it's not wearing tight, revealing dresses or attire with your boobs falling all, out all over the place. That is not the representation. Honestly, it's not even the representation outside of that facility that you guys are calling church. Understand that culture says you can wear coochie cutters, that you can walk around and, and just gyrate and, and throw up your bottoms in the air. And this is acceptable by culture, but God spews those things out, but it even gets worse because he's taking it right into these places that you guys are calling church. And he's saying, he's saying today, because it's the same, y'all. Y'all can read Matthew 15. It says the same kind of stuff. You have made my house a den of thieves. That's what's going on. Because you are doing everything within this structure you call the church to pimp it. Mm -hmm. and, and culture is superseding Christ. When, please tell me guys, when is the last time that you heard any kind of a message that talked about our accountability mm -hmm. to Christ? That, that, that we would have to repent, that we would have to be baptized, that we would have to be saved, that there are repercussions to sin, that we would need to be reconciled, that we have been atoned for, that the blood has purchased us. People say there was no price paid. There's a definite price that was paid. That price was paid in blood, the perfect blood of our high priest in Christ. Myra went over to Hebrews 13, I believe, earlier. Yeah, six, five and six. Five and six, I'm sorry. Five and six. Yeah, but the whole book of Hebrews yeah. is dedicated to showing that this Jesus is in fact the Christ, the high priest, Amen. who is the final atonement needed for all mankind forever. But the culture says, mm. we fall down and we get up. That is not Christ. <laughs> that is culture. That means that you have an excuse to fall short time after time mm. again. But we who are the real church, the embodiment of that church as the, the feet, the arms, the legs, the fingers, the toes of the house of worship that God has created, not by brick and mortar, but by spirit and by soul. And that church will overcome any of the attacks of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Look, it talks about getting away from the festivals. Now those festivals in Isaiah were talking about the major festivals of that time. But today we can call it Easter. We can call it Christmas. These things are pagan. They are not of Christ. Sure, people do whatever they want to do in their own homes. And I'm not telling people that they cannot take December 25th, if that's the way you feel, and dedicate it unto the Lord. But isn't it better to dedicate every day <laughs> unto the Lord as we're supposed to do? 
In fact, we should be having continuous communion because, my God, at the remembrance of what he's done for us, we do these things, not as a ritual, but every day I cannot forget the flesh that was torn, that was bruised for my iniquity, the blood that was shed for my sin, my sin, your sin. I cannot forget that. It's an everyday thing. I don't need a cup of grape juice and a wafer in order to demonstrate that, Lord, I know what you have done, that I might have this life and have this life more abundantly. And I choose, I like your thing, I choose to follow you Amen. no matter what. I'm not that far away from finishing, guys. Look. Everything that we have done ritual, uh, ritualistically, God detests it. It's like going through the motions, y'all. It's like something I shared with somebody. I mean, what are you going to do? Put, put um, a, a condition on somebody? You got to go to church, a building? Uh-uh. A free will offering. A free will offering. Man, for me and Myra, church is every day. Every day is church because we're together. And we're together with Christ in the midst. That's church, y'all. And so when we are going out and we're talking with people, encouraging people, praying with people, sharing like we're doing right now, this is church. Don't need a building. I'd love to be out in somebody's field or on a mountaintop sharing the word of God. Why y'all think I like going out on the street, man? I, man, Myra tell you, you put me on the street, I'm talking. I am sharing the word of faith wherever I go. And isn't it funny? I could have a whole bunch of folk around me. Only a few will actually walk with me. That is the culture superseding Christ. Anyway, let me, let me continue. When it talks about all these celebrations in, in Isaiah, it talks about the new moons and, and new moon festivals were a way of also being able to track the calendar. That was the, the system of that time. You know, um, convocations i think about all these big conferences that we always are going to i ain't gonna lie to y'all i'm literally going to oversee two conferences while i'm traveling uh next week nevertheless these things have become more about money making and profiteering than actually growing the church, increasing the influence of Christ in this world. And so Isaiah is simply letting us see the delusion that the people of Israel are under. And I am trying to do my best with my wife sitting here <laughs> to show you the delusion that we're dealing with today as it pertains to what we call church compared to what church really should be all about. So once we've exposed the delusion, now we need to understand that Christ is the source. I'm going to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verses 6 through 12, okay, we say Jesus is the reason for the season. Y'all got to start expanding that season to understand that we ain't doing just a season unless you're saying that every day is the season because that's the way we do it here uh, in Guatemala, okay? This is the season. We're in a season every day. I don't need to proclaim at the beginning of the year, oh, this is the season of abundance. This is the season of breakthrough. This is the season of manifestation. My God, stop it. 
Stop the madness. Look, God is living. God is organic. God is beyond being universal. What God is doing is continuous, y'all. So we don't have to put him and lock him into a season. God is always moving, always acting, always speaking. Even when you don't think he's speaking, he's always sharing. Mm -hmm. So let's just be in his season, which is every day. And understand this in 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 12. For it says in scripture, look, I say, excuse me, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. So you who believe See his value. That's a key thing. You who believe see his value. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own. Y'all would hear this peculiar people. So that you may proclaim the virtues mm -hmm. of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. Mm -hmm. You were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul and maintain good conduct among non-Christians so that though they may now malign you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God when he appears. All right, guys, I'm going to start on that, that last part and work my way back. But, but listen, guys, all of you who say that you are card-carrying members <laughs> of the truth in Christ, if you are hostile to non-Christians, if you are hostile to anyone, even if they're not flowing in the faith like you think you are, if you publish haterade and all types of wickedness, as I've shown Myra this week, many people posting things of negative content that call themselves Christians. Okay, you all do not have to agree with each other's points of views, but why is it that Scripture tells us in Matthew, blessed are the peacemakers, and yet the so-called peacemakers do everything to create havoc and confusion. And then you go to your churches, as you call them, and you call yourselves glorifying God in ritualistic uh, practices and observances that have nothing to do with faith, but everything to do with complying to the culture of this world. 
I told you guys, I talk strongly because this is just truth. And I'm going to just tell you now, if you share truth, you will not be liked by people. You will not be popular by the world standards. But listen, it tells us literally, have good conduct among non-Christians. So I don't have to flow in your pagan belief to still show the love of Christ. I don't have to condone what you're doing and the practices, and I don't have to adhere to them. But I do have to love you enough to show you there's another way. Amen. And that's the part we keep missing. We know how to throw stones at folk, but we don't know how to encourage them. I had to literally put out a note to somebody I care about just yesterday, just to love on them. Y'all won't never know who it is, so I did it privately. But I'm telling you, you don't just crush people because of your faith. Mm -hmm. I can't tell anybody that they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. I can say the scripture says that if you do this and do that, that your reward mm -hmm. will be uh, uh, what's that word? Uh, I can't think of the word. But your reward will be consistent with what you have done. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be a good look. Mm -hmm. So, guys, when you look at all of this, it's talking about Jesus being that stone. That one that if you would just simply mm -hmm. adhere to that stone... You're going to be all right. But the ones that reject it, they're going to trip over that stone. And we don't want anybody to trip over anything. You know, and so God is saying here that, are y'all really listening to this? You weren't even a people before Christ. You weren't anything to God. None of us were. You weren't a people. But... In Christ, holy nation, royal priesthood, you know, a peculiar person, chosen generation. My God, ain't that better than identifying as a sinner? Oh, my goodness. Don't get me started. So anyway, I'm getting ready to, to cap this off. So we, we have talked about exposing the delusion. We have talked about understanding that Christ is the source, nobody else. Now, how we are to live within the culture as believers. Because, hey, guys, this world ain't going nowhere. So now we got to figure out how do we navigate in this world? How do we not stumble upon the very stone that we say we follow. So, Romans 12, starting at verse 4 through 18, and this is how I'm capping off today. For just as in one body we have many members, and not all the members serve the same function. But let me just put it aside there. Ladies, hear that and know that equality by God's standards means two things. Both men and women are equal in our sinfulness and we are equal in the way that God loves us in spite of that. We're equal. We are not equal in position, in purpose, as far as God has established it, in functionality, in biology, in physicality. We're not equal. No one's greater, no one's lesser in that way. And we need to understand that it would just get rid of a lot of confusion. Look, I'm going to just put out there because this happens in our household all the time. 
I don't care. My wife, she gets up and she does all this exercise and all, every day. I'm sitting there watching her going all kinds of stuff. I ain't going to show you what she does because <laughs> I'll get in trouble. But if she can't get the cap off the jar, <laughs> it's coming to me. I'm just saying. And it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. It's just the way it is. By the same token, not that it would happen now, but I ain't coughing up no child out of this body. Cannot happen. Could never happen the way I'm biologically made up. It has happened. And heh, if God so saw fit, it could happen again. We don't, we're not trying to let y'all in on anything, but you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, if you believe the account of Sarai, who became Sarah, you got to believe all things are possible. All right. So what are we talking about? Uh, okay. We said we who are many are one body in Christ individually. We are members who belong to one another. By the way, that's church, y'all. And we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If the gift is prophecy, let that individual, uh, excuse me, that individual must use it in proportion to his faith. If it is service, he must serve. If it is teaching, he must teach. If it is exhortation, he must exhort. If it is contributing, he must do so with sincerity. You don't have to brag about your giving, y'all. Just do it, all right? If it is leadership, he must do so with diligence. By the way, you don't have to brag about that either. I love people say, I'm a leader. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Okay. All right. If it is showing mercy, he must do so with cheerfulness. Love must be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another with mutual love showing eagerness and honoring one another. Do not lag in zeal, be enthusiastic in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, endure in suffering, persist in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Consider what is good before all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Didn't say just saints, didn't say just believers, with all people as possible. So, as I close this all out, we talked about exposing the delusion. We talked about Christ being the source to overcome that delusional state. And now we're talking about living peaceably within any culture as believers. And as simple as this, it is just to live as Christ mm -hmm. and let the chips fall where they may. 
it doesn't say here that they're going to always respond peaceably. There are going to be times when you're going to have to say, I did my very best, but this person refuses and rejects Christ's love. It does say, if possible, live peaceably. We're supposed to put forth our very best effort, but understand this, everybody's not going to receive that love. And I get it. And it's okay. Perfectly okay. I don't make judgments on how people show me affection. I just try to love people at whatever state that they are in. Because the scripture tells me that exposes Christ to them. I may never see the manifestation of their salvation and their discipleship, but I did my part. That's all that matters. We keep trying to put statistics on, oh, we got 50 saved today. You know, we did this. Man, we were doing it, boy. Stop it. You just live peaceably to the best of your ability among others. You reject all of those things that reek of evilness and everything, if it's a hug, if it's a touch, if it is, uh, you know, provisions that are needed, we do those to the best of our ability because when we're feeding those who are of low estate, scripture tells us we are literally feeding Christ himself and we don't want to rob God. We keep wanting to go back to Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? <laughs> and not even understand that the real robbing that was going on in that day was the surplus that was supposed to be for the community. It wasn't about building funds and all other kind of crazy things that we have turned giving into. Anyway, I'm going, I'm going to leave it there. Um, guys, we thank you. Again, just as a reminder, oh, Danny Mack is watching. Hey, all right. So uh, I'm going to leave it right there. Remember, Myra and I will be on hiatus uh, until August 18th. And it by that time, we'll both be back in the USA, y'all, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and we'll do our thing out of Baltimore. So until then, Myra, is there anything else you need to say? Mm, All right. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. With that said, guys, we love you. Thank you for hanging out with us. We know it's summertime, and, and everybody's uh, attention is divided and going uh, to different activities and enjoying the weather, even though it's blazing hot, I think still on the East Coast. Um, nevertheless, the good thing about Facebook Live, it don't go anywhere, y'all. So y'all check us out later tonight. For those of you all that hang out on YouTube, consider uh, subscribing to our channel, which is Adoration Talk Radio, right on YouTube. At this point, there's well over 300 videos that you can take a look at. We've been doing this since about 2020, and there's a lot of content out there. Um, and forgive us for all the content that came in 2020. We were learning then, but now we know what we're doing. So we praise God for that as well. With that said, God bless you, and God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.